without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jim Plates. Thank you, Doug. I'm glad you're here. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Your biography, The uh, Boy from Peoria, is a fascinating read. You must be honored to be the subject of a book. How did this come about? Well, I think I've been talking about it for seven or eight years, and I know I could never write it. And finally, two great people, Tracy and Owen, came to me after they did Chuck Brenslow's book and asked me if I would consider uh, doing a book with them. What were your initial thoughts on that? Uh, I was excited. I didn't know how much I wanted to put out there, but uh, I thought if uh, I'm going to put it out, it's going to be exactly what I, it is. It's true. So, and don't be. I've never been ashamed of anything I've done. So, uh, I'm kind of happy it's out there. My family's accepted it quite well. So, I attended your book site. Uh, it was on December seventh, and many people came out for your autograph. And it was in the middle of a blackout as we were there. There was a power failure, and they had to set up candles. It was it was very gothic in its in its feel. How did you feel having so many people there for your autograph and all that interest? I was overwhelmed. I think uh, to see that many people that came out. First of all, and I think the thing that shocked me the most is when the lights went out, they all stayed. They didn't leave. And they uh, just sat around and talked uh, with the candles. And then Tracy and us got a flashlight and on. <laughs> and so we sat there and signed books with a flashlight while everybody enjoyed the candles. So it, it, it was, uh, I was, uh, and a lot of the people I hadn't seen in a long, long time. And there were some people that shocked me that they were there. Uh, one of my doctors from years ago, uh, I didn't know he had separated from his wife. And, she came up and introduced herself, saying, I'm so-and-so's wife, which threw me for a loop. I don't know how she even knew about the book signing, but uh, uh, there were some exciting people there that uh, I was happy to see over the years. Well, going down memory lane a little bit, what sorts of things did you have to remember for the book, or did you have to do any research of your own to remember things you had done? Oh, I had to remember a lot about my family, about my military days, uh, what bars I worked at, uh, people that I knew, entertainers that I knew, uh, people that came to the baton, entertainers that have worked for me. Um, that was a lot that I did. Uh, Tracy did a lot of the research when it came to the mafia trials and the police trials. Uh, and then a lot of the people around the country that I gave names to that they interviewed. Um, and of course, after the interview, they both came back with great questions after that. So there wasn't a lot to, to, to go, but there was a lot to uh, go back. And there was a few crying moments to go back to your life and start remembering things. How long did it all take? Uh, about four months. Four or five months, I, I think was right, yeah. Well, please tell us a little bit about growing up in Peoria. You came out at a very young age. I came out, uh, truthfully, I, I, I came out at around eight years old is when I first had my encounter with the guy. I didn't know what it was all about, but I guess today they would say that I uh, probably was uh, uh, approached for, uh, and sexually molested as a child, not knowing what it was. But uh, as it kept happening, I sort of enjoyed it. And I always knew that uh, I didn't enjoy uh, toys, and I didn't enjoy hanging around with young kids. And when I finally told my mother, uh, right before my 14th birthday, I think it was, um, that I was gay, uh, she always uh, looked at me and said she knew there was something always different. Because I was always hanging around with the older guys at the church and, and watching the basketball games, and of course that's time now the, the, the towels in the shower. <laughs> which was different. <laughs> and uh, those kind of things. But uh, I had to tell my mother because I had got come, caught coming out of the hotel Pier Marquette about four in the morning by the house detective. And of course, my mother was the head chef there, and uh, the head uh, house detective knew me, and he said, 
doesn't some member of your family work here? I said, yes, my mother, and this is a friend of our family that was just out of the house, and as I walked it back up here, I was, you know, and uh, he said, well, I hope so, because that's the first thing I'm going to ask your mother tomorrow when she comes to work. So I waited up all that night until my mother got up the next day, and she said, uh, I can understand just only your father now. Because my dad would have never accepted it, I do think. Was there a time when you actually did share that with your father? Uh, I never did. Um, I moved out of home a few months later, right up to my 14th birthday, and uh, lived by myself. Of course, by then I had a job at Steak and Shake. And, uh, and then when I turned 17, uh, I went to the Navy. And uh, I was in the Navy. Uh, I was probably in six months when my dad uh, had his accident, and they rushed me home. But I didn't get home in time for his death, so he never knew. Well, in your biography, you state that the gay kids of Peoria raised you. How so? Well, I think I was so young uh, that one night I was walking down Main Street, uh, and in Peoria, uh, Main Street on Monday night was when all the stores were open. So everybody was downtown, and this uh, carload of guys came by, and they were calling me bag, a queer, sissy, girl. I was petrified. And I, I didn't know whether I wanted to jump in that car with them, or get running, or somebody from my school would see me. So I did jump in the car, and that's when I found out there were other gay guys, just like myself. And after that, they just sort of uh, took me under the wing, and that was like my other family. So these were gay people calling you names? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well. They were all gay. And I'll, I'll probably now, if you look back, they were all more feminine than I was, except for one of them. <laughs> Who were the Peoria girls? Oh, the Peoria, that was part of them. We used to. Uh, Meet on the uh, courthouse square every Friday, Saturday night, all the gays. Because we really didn't have any bar at that time to go to. Uh, and we had, if we're going to go to the bar, we had to go late because the only bars that really were uh, let us in were some of the black bars. Harold, uh, Harold's Club were, Harold's Club were Richard Pryor got his start. And the Blue Flamingo, they were very, very good to gay people. I mean, they sort of understood what we're going to. So when we would meet and get together on the, on the courthouse square and we would talk and carry on and of course we all started singing and thinking we were chorus girls. <laughs> we are the Peoria girls, we were our hair curls. <laughs> sort of do a little kick line there and have a great time. You served in the U.S. Navy rather. Please tell us about your Navy experience. My Navy experience was great. Uh, I went to uh, Great Lakes. Uh, luckily, the company uh, commander uh, liked me, so he made me the company clerk. So I had all the easy part of getting through boot camp. I didn't do have to do all that rigid stuff. And uh, finally, when I got out of boot camp, uh, my first assignment was uh, Little Creek, Virginia, in the uh, amphibious forces. And I was lucky because I went into the operations division. And uh, after about four months, the petty officer that was in charge left, and they couldn't get anybody else in. So they automatically just moved me up to go in third class without taking a test or anything and put me in charge of the office. But it was quite an experience in Little Creek because I didn't understand all this stuff about gays not being in the Navy because every office on that base was controlled by a gay person. <laughs> From the CO to the XO to everybody. And of course, this one lesbian we all thought was a lesbian. She was a lieutenant commander in charge of dispersing. But she was, we all admired her. She was so beautiful. But we just sort of all got along with her. So when we all thought she was a lesbian, but we really didn't know. But none of us hid what we did. I mean, for God's sake, we go to lunch. Of course, we always had early job passes because we were in charge of the base. And so the Marines would hold the door up and say, here comes the girls. <laughs> and we would just walk in. There was just nothing ever uh, about that that went on that uh, made you want to hide it. And so finally, uh, I ended up uh, working off the base. I worked at Norfolk General Hospital. 
first I worked at DuPont, I, I did charity work at DuPont in the emergency room just to fulfill time in Norfolk. And then I finally went to work at Norfolk General Hospital on the psychiatric ward. But I uh, eventually, then that gave me the money I needed to move off base. And so I'd leave the base every day at 2.30 and go to work maybe at 3.30, four nights a week. And, uh, and then I, uh, we had a very severe woman one night and she kicked me. And because uh, I worked the psychiatric ward. And I thought that uh, it was from the kick. So <clears throat> the head nurse, excuse me, I went down to the emergency room and um, they said, you've got to get to the Naval Hospital right away. And I said, what happened? They said, your appendix burst in. So of course, uh, the Navy Hospital always keeps you much longer because they can't get people there. So they want you to work forever. So I called my captain up and I said, uh, Captain, you've got to get me back. I can't take this way. So I got, me, I got back to the base and I went the next night to the bar to see all my friends at uh, the bar called Continental. Tazewell Street in Norfolk. And I got, I walked in, of course, the owner Jack got on the stage and started screaming my name and everything. And I turned around and there were six guys from my division. And we had a very close division because we were right in the operation of each all by ourselves. So there were only 19 of us that stayed on the base and, and that was in the in the locker room down there. We had our own away from the main base. So Six out of the 19 knew me. Wow. After a while, I think I went with 11 of them. <laughs> <laughs> so it, the Navy never was a hindrance to me. I, I, I don't know what the problem was, you know. And, uh, and then my son, I got honorably discharged, and I was out for a while, and then I went back in, and I got sent to trade uh, Hawaii, because I wanted to go back there, because that's where I was discharged. And I went to a very, very big gay party, and somebody turned 42 of us in. And they flew us all back to Treasure Island and kept us for week after week. And we could finally sign a general, general discharge and get out, or we could just go on. And I said, well, this is going to hurt me. I only have an honorable discharge. So uh, I said, I might as well sign it after a few weeks. And it was very strange there, too, because the Marines would always uh, make it, uh, elect a king and queen every week in the gay section, because there were so many gays. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I remember I met an entertainer that was very popular on the East Coast named Saji. And he was in there, and uh, he turned out to be a female impersonator too. But the more I looked at San Francisco, I said, I'm just going to sign the paper and get out. And I did that. He came back to uh, Waukegan, Illinois, and worked at St. Jude's Hospital. If you were very out and there were other out at that time, what were your thoughts on don't ask, don't tell, and then it's ultimate repeal? I thought it was the most ridiculous thing to ever put in. Because all the, it just seemed like anybody that was out uh, never had a problem. The ones that really closed it or stayed closeted were the ones that really had the problem. I mean, I just, I, I couldn't see it because, I mean, every, everybody that I knew, we went on a picnic or whatever, that the straights always wanted to be with us. So, I mean, and they were all of our, just like the guy said on TV the other night, when you're together in a unit, you gotta worry about the guy behind your back. You're not worried about if they're gay, they're black, they're white, they're straight. So I thought it was, I thought it was repealed. It should have never been there in the beginning. But they shouldn't have been discharging all those people either. Changing gears a little bit, what drew you to female impersonation? Uh, I think when I was uh, nine years old, when my mother would go to work and he was out of the house, I would pull the bedspread off and wrap it around me like it was an eating gun. <laughs> and I always wanted to be an entertainer, but I just didn't know how I was going to do that. And then uh, after a while, uh, we started dressing up in drag in Peoria, comic drag. You know, after a while, uh, I remember one of my sisters saying, Mom, she said, you know, and she told friends of mine, she said, we only knew two holidays. We were so poor because Jim used to come home with all presents, and Halloween, he'd always come home dressed like a woman. 
So uh, that's how I got, and after I left the hospital in St. Trees, I really thought I, I wanted to go more and stay with the church and maybe be a brother, but after a while, I, I, I knew I couldn't do that. Uh, and, and I worked the intensive care, you know, for so long, I've seen so much death. And I think I was with uh, Nat King Hill's father uh, the night he died in St. Trees Hospital. And uh, the next day I said, that's it, I'm going to Chicago. So I came to Chicago and fell in love that night. They were opening a bar here uh, called the Annex. Uh, somebody said they're looking for help. So I said, well, let me go down and apply. The guy said, are you a great bartender? I said, yeah, I know how to tip bar. I know how to do most drinks. So he gave me a chance. And so he said, when can you start? And I said, maybe a week or two weeks later, I could be back in from walking. So I got to work at the Annex. And uh, of course, I was there uh, five days, I think. And somebody asked for a screwdriver. So I went out to the bar, got the <laughs> screwdriver. <laughs> and Skip Arnold was the entertainer at that time. And of course, Skip heard it with the John Kendra trio at that time. And of course, Skip did the biggest <coughs> thing out of it. Skip D'Alessandro came running back. I thought I was going to get fired, but I talked myself out of it. And then they moved me down to the Chester building. We had to do uh, turnabout nights, where the bartenders would do the drag. Uh, and I did, you know, I kind of liked it. I, I did my best, and I was never a Mimi Marks or Maya Douglas. But, uh, <laughs> but I had fun with it. I was more of a comedian than anything else. And it was late for me to be, just like when I was a bartender, that was my stage, and uh, it was a form of entertaining. <laughs> Tell us about Felicia. <laughs> that was her. <laughs> uh, she got her start back in Peoria at 13 as Spanish guy, so I always made him happy. So he, I, he gave me that name, but I sort of dropped it for a long, long time. And the owner of the uh, Continental Bar in, in uh, Norfolk, he could never say, uh, Felicia, so he'd always say Flossie. But when I finally got back to Felicia was at the, uh, the well, it was at the old Sam's when I would twirl my baton and go down the bar and I made money twirling my baton. And then when we opened uh, the first baton, you couldn't use your name because people hated it when you used your own name. So we decided on the baton uh, and that's how it came about. And, and Felicia started skating back and forth across Park Street to get business down there and make people aware that we were there. And I would stop the traffic some nights on Friday and Saturday, two or three blocks while I'm twirling in the middle of the street. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how it all started out there. And so is that where you got the name for the twirling tradition I've heard so much about? Well, I was a drum major in high school and a uh, true junior high in Peoria Emanuel and in the Navy. and. Uh, I used to hate it when we would march in Peoria, because everybody would point, oh look, um, there's a boy twirling. <laughs> a boy in slacks. I never got to wear the little dresses like the girls. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, it was different. But that's where that came from. And I, I wasn't good at it for a long time. I think I went to 140 some contests before I ever placed third place. Oh. I was so excited when I got the third place. <laughs> Well, I read that you attended the first Chicago Gay Pride March. Uh -huh. Please tell us a bit about that. Well, that was different way back then because uh, they argued about they didn't want any leather and they didn't want any drag. It was just a small group of people. And I didn't know how I fit in because I was in leather and I was in drag. So I, we, we argued about it for a little while, but then eventually they all just let it go and I just came out in drag and participated. How was it was a few cars, a few marches, nothing big. Was it a big turnout? Not like it is now, but you know, not like any place that starts out small and gradually goes. So let's go back a step and revisit how the baton began. You, you mentioned bringing people in by twirling in the street and blocking the traffic, but what was the impetus for opening up that establishment? Well, the emphasis, I worked at Sam's and I asked the owners for a pay raise because we only were getting $65 and we were working like uh, 58 hours. 
And of course, they, uh, they, they didn't trust anybody at that time. They had a straight guy behind each cash register, although they were very, very good to me. Um, I eventually started carrying on with one of them, so. That made it a lot easier, but then when I asked for everybody to get us a raise, the one brother-in-law got mad, and so I started looking uh, for a place, and I see this uh, place at Clark and Hubbard, and uh, I went to the landlord and talked to him. I talked to Chuck Grinslow, who, who advised me in many ways of what to do. He's probably uh, the one we all have to go back to and thank, or none of us would be probably where we are today in Chicago, but it been for Chuck. And of course, uh, it was Al Friedman's father, Julius Friedman, who gave us the first spot. And um, my former bosses tried to get him to take it away and not let me have the lease. And it was a hard time, you know, and it, uh, we got it going and then we had to deal with uh, the police, we had to deal with the mob, and just about everything you could deal with, we had to deal with to get it going. And nobody would come down there because it was a very dangerous area at that time. I mean, it was Skid Row. Uh, Indian bars, uh, wino bars, Queen's Paradise where everybody got drunk and the old strippers would get on and strip on Friday night for a bottle of wine. March probably remembers that. <laughs> but uh, those times were hard and uh, it was rough. But I, I thought uh, the only week I asked Lady Baronessa and Jody Lee and Samantha George. I said, why don't we throw a show together? So we got out about 16 beer cases, and put a little curtain around the bottom, and got a little spotlight and did a show on a Friday night. Some people came. So the next week we did it again, and a few more people came. And then eventually we did Saturday night, and then we made a big old huge type stage that was different, but it was a stage. And then uh, that's how John kept going. Tell me about the 1973 shooting. <laughs> 1973 shooting was a woman that had, actually we all thought it was a woman that came in the back. And uh, a lot of the lesbians that played ball for me were there because it was movie night after the game at Lakeshore Park. And this lady came in and uh, her, later we found out she had so much uh, bullets and everything on her but she went out shooting and she shot the bartender in the back. Uh, luckily, John, it didn't, he missed everything that went on with him and, and uh, they chased her over to 505 North of South and she kept shooting at the police. Still at that time, no one knew it was a woman and uh, they eventually killed her. And then we found out that was the anniversary night uh, that her husband had left her and I guess he had came to the baton when he met somebody. Uh, that's what the story they told us. Well, you've been arrested numerous times. How many, and for what reasons? I think all together was about 15 or 16 times that you either were keeper of a disorderly house, or you were an inmate, or you were soliciting for prostitution, or you were the prostitute. <laughs> uh, uh, every one of the charges uh, were dismissed, uh, an SOL. The only one that held up for a long time was the one from the Chesterfield. And that's when they tried to pin it on me, the owners of the bar. And uh, somebody said, you better get a good lawyer because they're going to pin this on you. And then they use it to open the bar back up. And so that's when I reached out to Ronald Kleepak. And it took us about 12 more judges 25 more times in court, but we finally got out of it. She even called the one judge, uh, Judge White that time, told him he was prejudiced and he was corrupt and everything. And that was after he had found out that I'd been coming to court all this time without a bond. And that's when he slapped another bond on me after they had already returned my bond money back to me. So if it hadn't been for her, I probably would have been gone a long time before. But all the, all the time they would take us, it was always if they raided a bar, if they would hit Clark Division early, then they would Clark, uh, I mean Clark Division, then they would do Clark Diversity later. And if they seen they let you out at one place, they'd be sure to grab you at another place. And I remember one night at the, the Chesterfield, they uh, came in 
and Robbie Landers had come down to get a pack of cigarettes, and she was in red pajamas, red silk pajamas, because we all had apartments upstairs. And they were in there, and they said, grab him, he was here last night. And they yanked him in, and of course, they had, um, I think 37 of us went that night, just Leavenworth and State. And they always let you out at noon the next day, just so they can embarrass you if you were in drag or whatever, because there's a lot of people around. And then uh, you always learn to keep 25 or $50 in your pocket for bell money, and if you smoked, you always had a pack of cigarettes. A method to your madness. Pardon me? A method to your madness. Yes. <laughs> Well, I believe we have among us a couple of the uh, baton performers. Would you like to briefly introduce them, Nathan, acting as our hostesses? If you would, come on down for a second. Us on stage, never. <laughs> They're both entertainers of the baton. They've both been with me a long time. And they are both former Miss Continentals. Please introduce. This is Bibi Marx. Hello. And this is Maya Douglas. And Mia, uh, Mimi just came back from Thailand, where she entertains for a month over there every year after winning the big pageant in Thailand. Well, coming back to the cold must be awful. Uh. <laughs> but I asked them to come out tonight, and they consented to do this. So That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Well, in, in the course of your journey, you've appeared on Donahue. Tell us about that. Donahue, probably in my in my uh, in my in my viewpoint, was probably the best interview, best interviewer, and uh, the best person to ever go on his show. He was very considerate to us. He was always kind to us. He really got into you. Not just that you're a female impersonator, but he wanted to know all about you. And he was just great all the way around. I remember one time we were in the green room when he was here at NBC uh, in Chicago. And he said, you know, I'm going to come in the green room in a minute. And I'm going to bring somebody in and don't get shot. But just let it be mellow. And I said, okay. And he walked in, and here he came walking in with Jerry Barwell. And I thought Jerry Barwell was going to fall over. <laughs> He looked at us and took a look at us, and all of a sudden, he, out the door he went. You know, he wouldn't stay in the green room, but uh, at least he got to see us and meet us. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Donnie, you really was great. He really got into the personal stories of everybody and uh, and talked more about you and your family, your, your what made you what you are, and he wanted to know all that. He didn't just want to know, are you a man or are you a woman, that type of thing, like Maury Pope used to do. Put him on there and let the audience guess is that a man or a woman. He wanted to get more in depth of what it was. And he was just great. So, was your appearance on Donahue more about female impersonism, impersonationism, or was there any kind of controversy? Did he have you speaking with religious people or something? No, there was never any controversy. Uh, there were a lot of people in the audience that were religious or whatever, uh, but he talked about female impersonating and talked about our personal lives. And of course, the baton um, got one of the biggest boosts for Bill because Herb Cupston called me up one night and said that uh, he was going to bring Bill and Marlo in. And he did bring them in. And after that, Bill asked us to go on his show. And I think we went on his show six times, if I remember. And then from, uh, from him, uh, people are talking, picked us up. And we hit, I think, uh, five or six, seven cities on people talking. Right after that, that's when I met Oprah when she was. People are talking in 82 when she was involved in Baltimore. Well, please tell us a little bit about the uh, trials regarding the payoffs. Uh, the police or the other ones? <laughs> Both. <laughs> the police trials, I didn't have too much uh, really to do with that because uh, I, I, I went to. Uh, down there, and of course, I wouldn't testify. And the attorney was getting very, very upset at me. The um, Dan Webb, who was the attorney at that time, because I wouldn't talk. And then they said they were going to lock me up, and uh, they did lock me up with for about 24 hours, I think it was. And then they brought me back in front of an older uh, black judge named Judge Austin, 
And he said, are you ready to talk, young man? And I said, well, Judge, I really have a problem. And he said, what's your problem? And I said, I don't know any of these officers at Jim Flint. I, 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 they don't know me as Jim Flint. I don't know them as Jim Flint. And Ed Bogle's the one that told me to do this. So uh, he, uh, he just said, tell the judge that you own a, a bar for female impersonators. And I said, sir, I live as a woman. I cut my hair out of respect for you and your courtroom. And I came down here today to testify. So I don't know any of these people as Jim Flint. The judge got so rattled, he started getting uh, recessed, recessed, recessed. And we went in his back room, and, and uh, we went through the whole thing again. I think I contributed to his heart attack. I'm not sure. But, <laughs> but uh, afterwards, uh, he looked at me, and he said, young man, I, I don't think we need your testimony. So he let me go. Uh, the mob trials were a little bit different. Uh, because I uh, I had never paid off uh, the plea uh, the, the mom. They kept coming to the door, asking me to do so. And of course, I, I would refuse to do so. And I said, I went through all this in 1971, and I really wasn't going to get myself involved in all this stuff again. And Doug Roller uh, was the attorney general by this time. And uh, I remember they, they came one night uh, on a Sunday night, of course, I was gone. And there was a, um, a lady that worked at the Oak Tree, and she was the night hostess. And she called Richie. She called up. Richie was my doorman, older doorman, uh, about 80 of Cedric. But she said to him, uh, Richie, uh, where's Felicia? And he said, uh, I don't know why. And she said, well, get a hold of him if you can, and tell him not to go home tonight, and to call me right away. So I did call her right away, and she said, I think you better do something drastic. And I said, what, what, what's going on? She said, well, they just put a hit on you. So I stayed up all night. I, I mean, I was trembling. I, I, I didn't know what to do. Um, and the next day, I went, there was a drugstore on Oak Street, uh, on Rush Street, right underneath the Rush Up, was where the head man on Rush Street that handled everything. So his name was Joe, and so I went over, and I called him out to his car. I said, I don't want to talk to you in there because I don't know what's bug and what isn't bug after what all I'm going through. So we got in the car and I said, you know, I perjured myself in 1971 for you guys. I, I lied, I lied, I lied. I can't do that again. And But I want to tell you, I have not told anybody anything. I have not uh, talked to the feds. I have not did anything. And he said, well, I'll get it all solved and bring it back in. But you tell all the bar owners over there to be careful because somebody's going to get hurt if they keep talking. And so I called four or five of them together and I said, I don't know if any of you guys are talking to the feds or, or what or, or not, but somebody's going to get hurt. And so, uh, and then I found out at that time that they had put Bob Hugo under the witness protection plan from the Gloria home. And Carol, uh, they, she was taped going in because they played some of the tapes for me. And then they played some tapes for people calling my house and saying, this is Joe, and so forth and so forth. And I said, I can tell who it was. I don't know the man's voice on the phone. It could be you doing that. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I've not paid off, I'm not gonna pay off, and so forth. So they wouldn't take an answer, so then they called me back down. And Doug Roller said to me, he said, uh, you're not gonna do to me what you did the last time you was here. And I said, what did I do? And he said, you know damn well what you did. And I said, then I was young and stupid. Now I'm, yeah, now I'm proud and gay. <laughs> so he kept me there, and I was there five days, and we were in front of Prentice Marshall. And I was in the, in the jury, in that booth where they keep you. And all of a sudden, the defense line running in for the mob. Well, I know him very well. I mean, Pat to it, his wife worked on campaigns together. but. Doug Rowler kept running in there, and he said, you're not supposed to talk to him. He's the defense attorney. I said, well, how did I know that? I thought he was in here to testify, too. I said, I'm here as your guest. And so I finally I got word to the judge. That was my fifth day down there. And I let the judge know I was a Cub fan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the uh, Cubs were going through the playoffs. And uh, we luckily we did win that playoff. But he would keep me informed on the score. And he told me that, he told the federal attorney they had to use me that day or they had to let me go. So they uh, brought me out in front of all these people. 
And uh, you could tell he was trying to let him know I was gay, but he wouldn't say anything to it. So I said, you know, if you want to, you can tell all these people I'm gay and I own a female impersonation bar, and they're all welcome to come to see the show. <laughs> so from then on, he went through all of his questions. I thought it was only five or six questions, but after I reading to Tracy, it was tons of questions. But I made it through it, and uh, I was released that day. And uh, a very good friend of mine, who is a bookie, uh, was at Cup Park uh, that day, and uh, I got up there, and he, he walked by, and he would say hello to me. And I thought, why is he not speaking to me? So later I went up to the stadium club, and he was up there, and I said, what the hell happened? You didn't say hello or nothing? He said, what happened in court? And I said, I got out of there. I didn't have to do anything. I got out pretty clean. I said, why? He said, well, there were two hitmen set right behind. So that was enough to say I never want to be involved in that again. So I haven't been and I won't be. Well, I have a question I, I knew I could not overlook. Uh, please tell us about the continental pageants. How did they begin? Okay, but before I do that, I want to let anybody know though, if you ever have to go through any of that, it's the most terrifying thing you can ever go through. The continental pageant system started because I had uh, there were other pageants for female impersonators that were very discriminatory. You couldn't have any body improvements. Uh, you could not live as a woman. You couldn't have any silicone, any hormones, any anything. You couldn't have facial uh, improvements or anything. So um, after a couple of years, uh, I thought, well, I'm going to enter this just to see if what they said is all true. Because I had a, a couple people with me that were entering the pageant too. And uh, I did uh, enter one one year, and she won, and then the next year I entered another one. So this year I was going down with Leslie Grishonet, and I forget who the other was, and we had entered it, and they told us we had to be there at 9 o'clock in the morning. And we got there at 9 o'clock, and we had to fly all night because uh, we, we worked till 3, and talking to this one little entertainer, she took three buses to get there to be on time. So we got there. There were about 18 people missing. So they said, well, we're going to get them until 1 o'clock this week on the other day. I thought, well, that sounds kind of wrong. You know, you had to be here at 9, but now it's that time. And so we got to this week up here, and uh, there were still a lot of them not there. And so the, uh, the owner of the pageant said, well, we're going to give them until 7 o'clock tonight for registration. And I put my hand up. Do you have a problem? I said, yes, I do have a problem. I said, all of us had to come here. A lot of us worked all night. This person took three buses. The rule was you had to be here at 9 o'clock. And then it was 1 o'clock, and now it's 7 o'clock. And I think we should just vote all those people out of the pageant. Well, they were a little bit hesitant, but they eventually did it. And the last hand to go up that day was hot chocolate. And uh, she won the pageant that year. But after the pageant started, um, I was standing at the front of the, de uh, the door with John Austin, who was the manager of the Sweet Gum Head, uh, Dina Jacobs, and a couple other, and there was one of the judges there, and she was just ridiculing this little person from Indiana terribly. I mean, just, she doesn't know what this is, and she didn't know what that is, and she didn't know what, what uh, the category meant, sportswear. And so I, I looked at her, I said, you know, miss, you're a judge, and I don't think you have a right to stand out here and really one of the contestants. First of all, I didn't know what sports were either. Sports were, I thought, was sporty. I didn't know it was furs and a hat and a suit like you were going to the races. I said, I thought it was something to do with sports. I, I think you're wrong by doing that. She said, well, first of all, you should open your mouth or I could disqualify you. I said, you know, you don't have to disqualify me. Because first of all, you shouldn't even be a judge because you were so drunk a week ago in Knoxville, you set your fur on fire. <laughs> and you're drinking now. So I said, you're not going to disqualify me because I said, it don't mean nothing to me. I'm disqualifying myself. And so the person that owned the pageant started to stand up. And I said, don't say anything because I've been waiting to punch you for three days. <laughs> <laughs> so I left, I, I left that and went back to my hotel and the lady baroness had come back and she said, Jimmy, you've got to apologize to him. I said, apologize? Well, you're in the top 12. You've got to apologize. 
I said, I'm not apologizing to anybody. So we went to get our stuff, and she said, you can't take your stuff out of here until the pageant's over. And I said, you and who else is going to stop me and stop Leslie from taking our stuff out of here? Because the one judge told Leslie, you know, we pay for hometown girls before we do out of town girls. So Leslie was ready to go too. So we left, and uh, I had a couple of friends there. Uh, Perez, oh God, I can't even think of now. Now Perez is the last name, and, and uh, Woody Brooks. And for about two years, they kept saying, why don't you start a pageant for everybody? Because that way, you know, nobody could be discriminated if they have body parts, or they have the hands themselves, or they have silicone, or they, they're still female and first aid. So a couple of years ago, I, I, I finally said, okay, I'll do that. Uh, I'll start it. So we put it all together, and I said, this is never going to work. So we went to Park West, and, 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 and thank God Del Niedemeyer owned it. They, he didn't charge me a lot of rent, because we certainly didn't fill the place up. And uh, we uh, had 13 contestants. And Chili won, and I think uh, Dina Jacobs was first runner-up, and Andrea Nicole was second runner-up. And from then, it just sort of, every, more people started talking about it. And the next year, we had a few more people, and the next more. And now, uh, we're not the largest pageant, but I, I think, uh, as most people say, we're the elite pageant. We're the one that they really want to win. And a lot of them will go to other pageants and win that first before coming, or they'll come and realize they, they're not at the potential to win continental, so they will go to another one and then come back a couple years later. And some have been in it seven or eight, nine years before they finally win it, but they don't give up. And now we have uh, probably with Miss Continental, Mr. Continental, Miss Continental Elite, which entertainers over 40, and Miss Continental Plus, with ladies over 225, we probably have something like 60 pageants. Wow. Yeah. So we stay on the road quite a bit. Easter is uh, at the Park West. It, um, Sunday and Monday is... Uh, the preliminary for Elite and Plus, and then the Plus Finals is on Monday, the Elite is on Tuesday, and then on Labor Day we have the men uh, on Saturday, Friday and Saturday, and then the, uh, the, late, uh, the female first nurse ladies, as I call them, on Sunday and Monday. Mm -hmm. And it sells out pretty rapidly. Well, I read in the book that a plethora of uh, stars have visited the baton. I remember seeing Madonna, Sammy Davis Jr., Joan Crawford as well. Joan Crawford used to come in in, in the 70s. And Richie, my doorman, was a very, very good friend of Joan Crawford back during the war. And uh, Joan could never get people to uh, wait tables for or clean her house during the war. There was nobody around. And at that time, Richie was a top Hollywood model. You'd never know that years later, but uh, he would be fun. And he knew everybody, and uh, he would get a lot of the gay kids to go up and do Joan's parties. So that whenever Joan would come to town, she would have lunch with Richie and I, or she would have dinner. She loved to go to the Drake and the Cockdor. So that's usually where we ended up with Joe Crawford. And then later, when the book was written, I said, Richie, how much of that book is actually true? He said 95% of that book is true. Because he said the studio that everybody could buy with everybody. When they made a movie, an actress, she could do anything she wanted. So, Which stars made the biggest impression on you? Well, certainly she did. Lauren Bicall because of her mystique. Uh, Rock Hudson because he was so down to earth and one of us. Uh, Uh, I, I think Madonna was real good when she came in that night. She was so down to, down to earth and, and, and didn't try to be anything she wasn't. I wasn't so happy with some of the people with her, but she was. <laughs> but I think in all, if we had to go back and talk about not only stars or movie stars or whatever, I think we had to bring up Janet Jackson because I think she has been the greatest to our club. Uh, when Janet comes in, she's doesn't just run in and run out. She's been known to be there three or four hours with us. And even the last time she was here, she invited everybody to the Chicago Theater and brought all the girls up on stage with her to do a number. Oh, wonderful. And that's just the way she was. And she was uh, 
just a great, great person. So I think those are, are the ones for different reasons that made such an impact. What's been your greatest challenge? <laughs> my biggest challenge. I think my biggest challenge is uh, to be back down to 190. <laughs> I've been on every diet in the world, and it just works. <laughs> but I think that's been my, my biggest challenge. I didn't have a challenge with my family because they all understood me and accepted me at so early at the age. Uh, I've always been blessed to have a lot of good friends. Uh, the Navy was never a challenge. My business was always a challenge. Am I doing the right thing? And how do I keep it going? And how do I keep people with me? And so forth as that. Um, and lately, uh, I think one of my biggest challenges lately is like I said to Marge earlier, I, a, a way to get more of us out on a Sunday or something to see everybody talking and having a good time instead of seeing them at a wake. Because I, I, I go to a wake and I see everybody I haven't seen in 25 years, and I'm just tired of seeing that. It's quite a statement, actually. What's the biggest misconception about you? Um, that I'm, I'm pushy, I'm outgoing all the time. Um, people are afraid to talk to me. They think I can't be talked to. Um, those are about the, the most good people, even in Continental, they say, oh, I can't talk to him. And I'll be in a pageant in uh, some little town, and some little person will come running up, and they'll ask whoever I'm with, they say, do you think he'll sign an autograph for me? They're afraid to approach me on their own, but you know, it's it's kind of nice. I see what a lot of big stars go through because to some of those uh, uh, young gay lesbians that don't get to go into big cities and we come to their cities, they read about it, they hear about us, we're kind of role models to them. Uh, they are pretty approaching. Well, in conclusion, I'd like to take a second to acknowledge uh, Tracy Dave and Owen Keehan here in the audience. Uh, they are the authors of The Boys of Peoria. And you brought a couple copies, didn't you? Yes. That are here. So we have about nine copies if anybody wants to buy one. And, and Tracy bought some color ones with her if, oh, if anybody needs them. So, uh, and I'm sure they wouldn't mind the autographs. I don't have a lot with me. I've, I've shipped so many to Florida for the big signing down there February 19th. So. Well, at this point, I would like to thank you very much for being part of this chat. I hope you enjoyed it. I did. I hope you all did.